Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, let's, uh, let's settle down and get started. There is a whole empty row of seats in the front row, so please, if you're looking to get seated, don't hesitate to come up here. You won't be disturbing us, and we don't bite. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the, um, the annual Supreme Court forum, um, and I will uh, uh, get on with introductions. Um, so I'm delighted with our panel. We have with us uh, legal journalist Amy Howe, um, who is co-founder of SCOTUS blog and reporter for Howe on the Court. And she continues to serve as an independent contractor and reporter for SCOTUS blog, where you will see, still see her writings. Um, before turning to full-time blogging, she served as counsel in over two dozen merits cases at the Supreme Court and argued two cases there. And she has co-taught Supreme Court litigation at both Stanford and Harvard Law Schools. Roman Martinez is a partner at, in the DC office of Latham and Watkins. Uh, they sponsor this forum. Thank you, Latham. Um, and is, that's not why he's here. And uh, is, why he's here is that he's a member of the firm Supreme Court and Appellate Practice. He's also served as assistant to the Attorney General at the United States Department of, uh, I'm sorry, assistant to the Solicitor General um, uh, at the United States Department of Justice. He has personally argued seven cases in the Supreme Court. And before joining Latham, he served as a law clerk to Chief Justice Roberts of the Supreme Court and to then Judge Brett Kavanaugh of the DC Circuit. Um, uh, our own uh, Richard Pildes, uh, the Sudler family professor of constitutional law, is one of the nation's leading scholars of constitutional law and a specialist in legal issues concerning democracy. Um, as a lawyer, he has successfully argued voting rights and election law issues before the United States Supreme Court and the Courts of Appeal, and is a well-known public commentator on the law. He is a former law clerk to Justice Thurgood Marshall. Yours truly, I'm Deborah Malamud. I'm the Anne Bryce Professor of Law here at NYU. I served as a law clerk to Justice Harry Blackman, have taught on Supreme Court decision making and teach and write in constitutional law, administrative law, and labor and employment law. Um, and here we go. So I want us to start by setting the stage uh, um, for what the court was like last term. We're going to talk about some highlights of the last term before we get uh, into this term. Uh, one sets the stage. We had a contentious uh, confirmation uh, process and a new justice on the court. So what was it like? So justice Byron White used to say that every time the court got a new justice, it was a new court, which kind of makes sense when you think about it. But it's the nine of them. They didn't get to choose the other members of the court. And every time you get one new justice, it, it, it disrupts the dynamic. And to, the new justice doesn't know necessarily what has happened behind closed doors in the past. So any new justice is going to be a change. And the question was whether or not adding a new justice who's had a particularly co contentious confirmation hearing would make a, a real difference. And, and what would the, the experience be for him? And so the question came up when I was covering the Kavanaugh confirmation hearing, sort of what, what is his, first of all, what is his reception going to be like? And this was actually something that I had prepared for or tried to prepare for by going back and looking at Justice Thomas's memoirs to see how he had been received by the members of the court in the early 90s after his own confirmation hearings. And Justice Thomas had written in his memoir that the members of the court could not have been more polite and more welcoming to him. You know, he said that one of the members of the court, I think it was Justice Powell, took him aside and says, you know, once you're on the court, it doesn't matter how you got here. What matters is what you did, what you do once you're here. And so I would imagine, there's no way to know what happened behind closed doors, but I would imagine that Justice Kavanaugh enjoyed the same reception. You know, Justice Ginsburg gives a, a speech every summer to a group of law students from Duke, and this summer she described Justice Kavanaugh as a very decent and very smart man. I, if you know Justice Ginsburg, you know that she says exactly what she thinks, so that she was, was not saying that simply to be polite um, and kind. Um, and another way, I think, to measure sort of Justice Kavanaugh's reception on the court 
frequently the junior justice gets the opinions, to, to, to put it mildly, that, that the other justices are less enthusiastic about. And he certainly had his share of those, but he also had some pretty high pro profile opinions this term for a junior justice. He had the opinion in a case called Apple versus Pepper, which was a, an antitrust case. And he had the opinion for the majority in a case called Flowers versus Mississippi, a capital case involving jury discrimination. Um, another sort of way to look at the court, sort of from the press box looking at the court during oral argument, frequently when you get new justices, there are rumblings of complaints behind the scenes that the new justice is asking too many questions, that the new justice doesn't understand his or her place on the court. We heard a little bit about this with Justice Gorsuch. We heard it with Justice Sotomayor. I remember hearing rumors of Justice Blackmun complaining about Justice Ginsburg when she arrived on the court. And you know, whether or not those are founded, uh, you know, no justice gets to the court because he or she is a shrinking violet. Um, did not hear any of those with Justice Kavanaugh. He was, was prepared and engaged sort of knew sort of what he was supposed to be doing on the court in terms of his role as the junior justice. And then finally, I think the third thing that I would, would mention is the court's docket and its decisions this term. We're going to talk more in specifics. The first, ter uh, the first couple of months of the court's do docket on the merits were the cases that the Supreme Court had, decide had decided to review before Justice Kennedy announced his retirement. Um, they were interesting for reporters and for lawyers but not necessarily cases you're, that many people were going to be reading about on the front page of the New York Times. One had the sense that even if the, his colleagues didn't know that he was going to be retiring, uh, that Justice Kennedy was going to be retiring, they might have suspected and were, were uh, choosing a fairly uh, uncontentious docket. Um, after that, there, there were some cases that the Supreme Court seemed to sit on. There was the conventional wisdom in the, in the press room was that the court might have been trying to keep a low profile after Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation hearings. And so the, the, the petitions in the DACA case, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, the petitions in the Title VII cases, the Supreme Court considered them at their conferences in January and then did not act on them for months. And so there was a sense that perhaps they were kicking the can down the road so they could decide them in another term, um, which may or may not be true. Um, the one thing I will say is that by kicking the can down the road, if they kick the can down the road to this term, they're now going to be deciding them in the middle of a presidential election season, which they would also have been well aware of. So if you wanted to keep a low profile, <laughs> I'm not sure that June of 2020 is the best place to do yeah, that. Yeah, let's not um, go there. <laughs> and then the other thing with, you know, we're also going to talk about is you know, some of the decisions you know, perhaps were sort of what we might call minimalist or prag pragma pragmatic decisions. Um, you know, whether this was because of Justice Kavanaugh, whether this was because uh, it's something that the Chief Justice has always tried to do. Um, we, you, know, you all may live to read some of the Justice's papers. I probably won't, um, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Herman, do you want to talk to us a bit about Justice Kavanaugh himself? and yeah. what you might have expected from him in his first term and what you saw? Yeah, I think, I think what I saw was largely what I expected, although I will say I think one of the interesting things um, is the, the disparity uh, in, in the way that folks look at Kavanaugh, uh, Justice Kavanaugh, and look at the, at the court. I mean, you know, he is, because of the way the confirmation process uh, happened, I think he's sort of become in the larger public imagination like this cultural or political sort of flashpoint of controversy and criticism. And nothing could be, uh, and that's true of his supporters and of his detractors. I think that that vibe, that sort of sense of Kavanaugh as some sort of symbol of something bigger is really just not the way that folks at the court or in the, the kind of cloistered Supreme Court bar are looking at him. I think they're looking at him and experiencing Justice Kavanaugh now in the same way that I experienced him as a law clerk, which is that he's a judge, he's there to decide cases, he's not there to make headlines or you know be on the front pages every day. Um, I think I agree with basically everything Amy said in terms of the way he was received at the court. I, I will tell you from my own experience, I was there on the first day uh, that he heard oral argument, and w the thing that was most striking to me was you know I was sitting in the in the the lawyers section, the bar section of the courtroom. So I was very, you know, I was 20 feet away from everyone, and when the justices came out from the curtain, it was very, very striking, uh, the, the demeanor. Uh, they came out, 
Justice Kavanaugh is now sitting next to Justice Kagan on the court, and it was almost as if Justice Kagan made a very considered decision that she was going to be coming out with him. They were going to be laughing. They were going to be smiling. They were going to be joking together. It was almost as if she was she wanted to convey the impression to everyone there, including our, our friends in the in the uh, press bar, that, that this is a uh, in in the this is a, a kind of a new day, and she's one of us now. And you know, we we are not going to be, you know, treated or, or continuing to treat this as some sort of political flashpoint or, or, or point of, of controversy, rather, he's now on the court. And I think from everything you know, that's happened since then, whether it's the, the Ginsburg comments, whether it's his continued sort of public, uh, public displays of affection uh, that run both ways with Justice Kagan, uh, Justice Sotomayor has also uh, made generous comments about him. I think his personal integration has gone well. Uh, it's something that a lot of people don't know about the court is uh, that the junior justice sometimes gets, in addition to getting some less than favorable, less than optimal opinion assignments, you also have some other duties that come along with that. Uh, when the justices meet in their conference, they don't have any staff with them. And so the junior justice is in charge of being the secretary and writing, the, uh, keeping the notes for all the meetings. Uh, and when someone knocks at the door to deliver coffee or pass in a note or you know, the, the staff comes in with extra papers or extra uh, you know, case books to bring to the justices while they're meeting, Whenever the, the door knocks, the junior justice has to come up and answer the door. Uh, the junior justice is also traditionally on the cafeteria committee at the Supreme Court. And so by all accounts, Justice Kavanaugh has taken up those duties uh, with gusto <laughs> and is, uh, is, is serving admirably. Uh, I think in terms of the decisions, in addition to the points Jamie made, I would just say I think one interesting thing that jumps out, and I think Rick is going to get into the numbers a little bit, but, but uh, Justice Kavanaugh was in the majority more than any other justice on the court. Um, which was maybe a little bit surprising. I was a little bit surprised by that. Um, but he was in the majority, I think, in 91, 92% of all the cases. Um, so he's sort of looking for ways to find consensus. He lived up to expectations as agreeing with, with his more conservative colleagues, maybe more than with, with uh, some of the other justices on the court. I think he agreed with the Chief Justice the most and agreed with Justice Alito the second most. Uh, the with respect to the highest profile cases, he voted, he tended to vote mainly with the conservative block on the court. Um, he also, even though he agreed with the Chief Justice a lot and more than any other justice, he disagreed with the Chief Justice in a couple of cases where the Chief uh, sort of was a swing vote. And so uh, so I think the, one of the interesting things to, to watch going forward is that relationship between Justice Kavanaugh and Chief Justice Roberts. I think they have a very similar temperament. Um, but I think there's some subtle differences in the way they look at the law, and that's one of the things that I'm excited to look at in his uh, sophomore season. So um, you mentioned overall patterns of, uh, of voting in the court in the 2018 term. Um, uh, uh, I think students tend to focus a lot on 5-4 cases that come out predictable ways, but that's not all cases. If you want to talk a bit about the patterns that you saw. Yeah, and I want to set this in the larger context of this moment with the Supreme Court in American history because we are facing, for the first time in American history, a situation in which all of the justices appointed by presidents of one party or presidents of the other party are perceived to be kind of consistently either liberal or conservative, consistent with the Democratic or Republican president appointing them. And that has actually never happened before in American history. And there is a tremendous risk, which the court is very aware of, that the polarization in our politics is going to come to characterize the Supreme Court as well, or at least perceptions of the Supreme Court. Uh, and that's enormously risky for the institution and for the country, because to the extent the court has to resolve all sorts of controversial issues, and you can imagine ones connected to election disputes, uh, as an example. Um, the court needs to be perceived, and the country needs the court to be perceived as a legitimate judicial institution capable of uh, resolving these issues in a way that will elicit a fairly you know, broad amount of consensus in support of the decision, whatever the decision is. Uh, and this risk is heightened enormously, uh, in my view, by the communications revolution that we're now living through. Because all of the polarization and extremism that we know about in the Twitter world and social media commentary more generally is also char characterizing legal commentary on the Supreme Court in all those same social media kind of outlets. 
Uh, and so since most people aren't going to read Supreme Court opinions, they're going to get their perceptions from the various sources they look to. The fact that commentary on the court is as polarized as commentary on every other aspect of our politics is a big problem, big risk for the court. And as I say, the court is very aware of this, and they are clearly struggling uh, to try to preserve as much of a sense of legitimacy uh, as they can, and Amy has mentioned some of the ways they do that. Um, I actually wanted to talk about some of the statistics for the first term of the Kavanaugh Court, or the court with Justice Kavanaugh on it, uh, because I think that some of those statistics are probably going to be surprising to a lot of you. So, first of all, as is true generally with the Supreme Court, a majority of their cases are decided with at least seven justices in the majority, seven, eight, or nine justices in the majority. Um, there were about 29% of their cases decided by five to four votes last year, and that is somewhat higher than is typical. But of those five to four cases, uh, they break down in ways that uh, m you might find surprising. So the, and I don't like this language, but we all use it, the liberal conservative group of justices. So the liberal group of justices were in the majority in those five to four cases, uh, far, more, far more often than the conservative justices were in the majority in the five to four cases, at least last term. So about 47% of these five four cases had a liberal majority with one of the conservative justices, and about a third of the cases were five conservative votes to make a five four decision. Uh, so that was true on the conservative side in the one of the most high profile cases, the partisan gerrymandering cases, that divided five to four in this liberal conservative kind of line. But in the other big case last term, the census case, of course, five to four with Justice, Chief Justice Roberts joining the four liberal justices to make up the majority there. Um, last term, every conservative justice on the court voted at least once to make a five to four majority with the liberal group of justices. Um, and in fact, the, the four liberal justices vote together as a group much more often, at least last term, than the conservative justices did. So uh, 51 times last year, the four liberal justices out of 67 cases voted together. That was true 37 times for the five conservative justices. And just to, to illuminate a little bit more with numbers, what uh, Ramon was saying about Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh agreed with Justice Gorsuch, the two new appointees, about 70% of the time. That's exactly as often as Justice Kavanaugh agreed with Justice Kagan or with Justice uh, Breyer. Um, so I think all of that kind of provides a, a little bit of, of richer and deeper and fuller perspective on the patterns that actually took place and actual decisions um, last term. It's only one term uh, of the court, obviously, and we don't know how much that characterizes the way things are going to be going forward. Um, I thought before he went on the court, Justice Kavanaugh was probably closest to Chief Justice Roberts um, in the way he thought about various legal issues, and last term that they agreed 92% of the time, um, and that was the highest rate of agreement, so that, at least in one term, confirms my sense going in that the right image of Justice Kavanaugh uh, is to see him as much closer to Chief Justice Roberts um, than anyone else on the uh, court. So let me stop with that. Go ahead, Ramon. Yeah, just, just, to, just to pick up on that, because I think, like I said, the, the Roberts-Kavanaugh dynamic is very interesting, and I, I, I would be, I would expect to see that same pattern of a high level of agreement continue. At the same time, though, I do think it's important to note the ways in which uh, Justice Kavanaugh and Chief Justice Roberts disagreed, because they disagreed on probably two of the four biggest cases of the term, the census case, um, and then also the case involving our deference, whether courts should defer to, uh, to administrative agencies interpreting their own regulations. So if you sort of narrow the lens to just the kind of four big ones, if you, you know, the other ones being the gerrymandering case and maybe the, the Maryland Cross case, um, there is a fair amount of disagreement. And if you look behind that to the, 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 uh, the what they call the shadow docket, which is cases that are not at the court on the merits, and, and how do people vote on granting certiorari or not granting certiorari or granting s requests to, for a stay of lower court action, 
There's some interesting disagreements between the chief and, and uh, Kavanaugh there too. I think on, on one big case on immigration, a big case on abortion, um, uh, and maybe the, a handful of others, the Kavanaugh was you know, splitting off from the chief. And so although I, I agree that the, that relationship is likely to be tight and to continue moving forward, they're gonna vote together a lot of the time, I think there are also gonna be some interesting disagreements. Can I say one thing about Justice Gorsuch too? Because we have learned much more about him now that he's been on the court a little longer than Justice Kavanaugh. And one of the things that's becoming clear about Justice Gorsuch is that he is, I would say, generally a kind of a libertarian in orientation. Uh, and he's libertarian across different kinds of cases, which is not always true uh, of uh, various libertarian, let's say, political thinkers. So in criminal cases, he's just as much a libertarian as he is about government regulation in other arenas. Um, and that's part of why you see some of the patterns I'm describing. Justice Gorsuch voted uh, in criminal cases a number of times to be the fifth vote with the, the group of liberal justices uh, to not extend criminal law into certain areas or to hold certain criminal statutes unconstitutional. Um, and so that's turning out to be a very interesting and distinctive feature, I think, of Justice Gorsuch's jurisprudence and not something that would have been obvious, at least to me, before he, he went on the court. You know, there were a couple of times this term where you see, you know, Justice, uh, Justice Gorsuch actually sits next to Justice Sotomayor, and they're also quite chummy, just like Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Kagan are chummy on the other end of the bench. And there were several dissents of this term where there was Justice Gorsuch and Justice Sotomayor together, which is not something that I think we would have predicted uh, when he was being confirmed to the court. Last point on Gorsuch, yeah. it's very yeah. interesting. Uh, I thought the statistics showed, I think, that he did not agree with any other justice, with any other justice more than 80% uh, of the time. If you think about that, you know, even the, the justice with whom he agreed the most, and I forget if it was Alito or Thomas, it was only 80%. And I think that, that sort of reinforces Rick's point that he's kind of, um, he's very independent minded and he's gonna go his own way in a lot of cases and he's not gonna be as, as predictable maybe as some people thought. So, so I'd like to move us uh, in the direction of, of, of uh, taking dive into a couple of a, a few specific cases, but you know, keep all of this in mind as we're doing this. Imagine yourself in the role of somebody arguing to a court where this many people are in play, uh, where there are uh, different principles of alliance that you could that you could draw on, and uh, and you start understanding the real craft of uh, of being a lawyer before the Supreme Court. So um, we wanted to, to look at depth at a couple of, of really important and emblematic decisions from the last term before we move to, to what we can predict about the coming term. Uh, Rick, you wanted to talk about the partisan gerrymandering case, um, Mucho versus Common Cause. Sure, so um, I was part of the legal team representing the challengers to the partisan gerrymandering plan for the congressional districts in North Carolina. Uh, and it's an issue I've written about for many years and been involved in lower court uh, litigation about. Um, and this was sort of the culminating moment uh, for whether the Supreme Court was going to uh, strike down plans as unconstitutional partisan gerrymanders. Uh, there was no question that this particular gerrymander was one of the most extreme that um, had been developed and one of the most extreme that the court had ever seen. Uh, and so uh, I, I think this is a horrible thing for American democracy, and I have wanted the courts to get involved and to put limits uh, on partisan gerrymandering for many um, decades. So I was, of course, very disappointed uh, when the court in this five to four decision said that the entire issue is not one that's appropriate for the federal courts to address through constitutional doctrine. Um, but I will say that um, I, didn't view that decision as a partisan decision, although it fell out along these five to four lines. Um, because if you know the, the history of this issue in the Supreme Court, since the court first opened the door to the possibility that partisan gerrymanders might be unconstitutional, which the court did in the mid-1980s, um, there has always been a group of justices who have said, we don't think the court should get involved in this, uh, that, that grew over the years. The Supreme Court had never in all the years since the 1980s found anything to be an unconstitutional partisan gerrymander. 
The lower courts had never found anything to be an unconstitutional partisan gerrymander until about the last five years or so. So this is a legitimately difficult issue uh, in my view, even though I had very strong views about it, uh, that the courts have struggled with for decades and, and not been able to resolve. Uh, and the reason, just to describe the substance of this briefly, is that the, the court is kind of torn between two positions here. Um, one is to declare that all partisan gerrymandering is unconstitutional, kind of period. Um, and almost no justice has ever been willing to embrace that position. And part of the reason for that is that it's inevitable in the districting context because we have the pathological system of letting our politicians draw districts for themselves and their allies. You know, it's inevitable that whichever side loses in that process is going to turn around and complain that they were screwed for partisan reasons. Uh, and uh, if any hint of or taint of partisanship makes a plan unconstitutional, uh, then the courts are going to be asked basically to review every districting that takes place, uh, Congress for state legislatures, for city councils and the like, and virtually every justice has been reluctant to open up that Pandora's box. So the alternative, and this is what we were pushing for in the case, is uh, that the courts might hold that extreme partisan gerrymanders are unconstitutional, even if not every injection of partisanship into the process is unconstitutional. Um, and that creates its own difficulties, because then you have to help the court decide, well, what's extreme and what's okay, up to the line, not quite extreme. Uh, and that's a very difficult problem also for courts. Now, my view is that even if we won the case, um, the courts would be a marginal player in constraining partisan gerrymandering. As I say, I very much think that would be a good thing um, because it's a Wild West kind of situation right now. Um, but as a deeper and longer term solution to this problem, if you agree with me it's a problem, um, th the solution is really an institutional one that takes the power to draw districts out of the hands of the most self-interested actors in the system, the state legislatures, uh, who are inevitably gonna use this power to protect themselves, their partisan allies, um, and put it into the hands of independent commissions of one sort or another, which is what every other country that uses districts to elect people to office does. So ultimately, that has to be the solution to this problem. There has been movement in that direction in states where voters have the power through direct democracy to vote on an issue like this. So in the November 2018 elections, voters got onto the ballot in four states, some red, some blue, Missouri, Michigan, Colorado, Utah, uh, measures to take this power out of the hands of politicians and give it to various kinds of independent commissions. All of those initiatives passed. Now, not every state has direct democracy available to it, so it's not an option that can be used anywhere. Um, but in my view, that, that is the ultimate long-term solution. Um, I would, uh, state courts are doing something as well. I'm happy to have contributions from courts, but, but really at the end of the day, the solution here is, is an institutional one, not a one through legal doctrine, even though I would like there to be tougher legal doctrine on this. Just, just two things to add about that as, as, as we transition on. Um, I mean, we, just as we talk about the presence of Justice Kavanaugh, it's important to note the absence of Justice Kennedy, right? And, and in a sense, uh, this case was before the court at Justice Kennedy's suggestion that he might be prepared to find that middle ground. Um, uh, and his absence will have an effect in, in other areas as well. The other thing that I would, that I would add is that this is not the only case uh, for that we'll be talking about today where you might think of the issue as a political hot potato where the best solution isn't necessarily the one that has the Supreme Court resolve it, but what predictions can you make about the ability of the legislative process to really fix it? We're gonna see that with respect to DACA and equal rights as well, I think. Um, anybody else want to, to say something about this? Because I can, okay. The, the, the next grouping of cases, and, and this will help us transition from last term to the coming term, are those very fraught cases that really have to do uh, in part with the relationship between the court and the present administration. Um, 
we can start a discussion of that with the census case from last term, um, possibly talk about some aspects of the shadow dockets um, as those have been emerging, and then we can transition into, into the coming term. Anything to say? Yeah, I think I'm gonna start off with a little bit of background, and I think Rick might talk a little bit ab about some of the administrative law aspects of the census case in particular. You know, part of the problem, I think, for the justices with the partisan gerrymandering is that you know, th there's a census, and so they're drawing these maps every 10 years. Um, but so, as many of you know, this case arose when Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross announced that the administration wanted to add a question about citizenship to the 2020 census. And this was a question that had been on the census before, but it had been many decades, I think since 1950, since the question was on every cent the, the form that went to every household. And the administration said that it wanted the data about citizenship because the Department of Justice wanted it to better enforce the federal voting rights laws. Um, New York and other state and local governments went to court to challenge the decision to add the question. They said that the problem was that uh, households with undocumented immigrants and even with some Im with uh, Hispanic immigrants who were here legally would be reluctant to respond to the census. That would lead to an undercount which would in turn lead to a loss of funding based on population and potentially even to uh, members of represent representation in the House of Representatives. Um, I will spare you a little bit of the machinations in the interest of time um, that went back and forth, but originally the dispute came to the Supreme Court as a battle over the evidence. The challengers wanted to depose John Gore, who was the, the acting head of the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice. They wanted to, to depose Wilbur Ross, and then they wanted some additional evidence beyond the administrative record. The Supreme Court split the baby, said you can depose Gore and get the uh, extra evidence, you can't depose Wilbur Ross. Um, th the Supreme Court later agreed to hear a dispute over the evidence, but while they were briefing that, um, the district court in New York went ahead and decided the question on the merits, ruled that the government had violated, I, th I can't remember the exact word, something on a veritable smorgasbord of um, federal administrative laws. And so eventually the Supreme Court agreed to hear the merits of the decision to add the question to the, to the census, um, both of the administrative question and then also just for the sake of completeness, whether or not the decision to add the citizenship question to the census also violated the Constitution's enumerations clause, which as I'm sure you know, requires an actual enumeration of the, the population every 10 years. The case was argued at the end of April, and part of the reason why it all moved so quickly was that this is the 2020 census, but the federal government uh, repeatedly uh, told the uh, justices that it needed a decision by the end of June because it has to print literally hundreds of millions of pieces of paper related to the census and it needed to finalize the form by the end of June so it could start printing all of these pieces of paper. So they heard oral argument at the end of April and it really looked at you know, somebody who covered the oral argument as if the justices were likely to rule for the government at that point. Um, and then it started to really get interesting um, during May, uh, st st uh, stories started to emerge in the news and in other challenges to the citizenship question that were going on in the lower courts about a Republican strategist named Thomas Hofeller, who was a redistricting specialist. Um, he had died, and this is a, it's like a soap opera, um, but to give you the sort of the Reader's Digest version, he had died and the contents of his hard drive had made their way to Common Cause, the group that was litigating a redistricting case in North Carolina. And the evidence sh uh, strongly suggested that Hofeller was involved in the decision to add the citizenship question to the census, and that the decision had been made to provide an advantage to whites and Republicans in future elections. So this is all happening in May and June as the justices are trying to decide the case by the end of June. Uh, meanwhile, litigation in a district court in Maryland uh, is going on um, on the question of whether or not there was, uh, the, whether or not the question was added to discriminate against Hispanics. And it was really, this, there, there are a lot of parallels for, as someone who covered 
this case and was uh, covered the health care case as well, to the health care case um, uh, right up until the very last moment. Like the first thing that I did the day that the court issued the decision in the health care case was to get up and look at the court's electronic docket to see whether anyone had filed anything that day because both sides were constantly trying to get the justices uh, on the, the challenger side to send the case back to the lower courts for more proceedings uh, in light of this new evidence and on the government side to go ahead and stay the course and decide the case. So they decided the case at the end of June and it did not play out the way that uh, most of us had expected it, uh, it had. Um, another parallel I think to the healthcare case um, from my perspective at least was that the Chief Justice as, as many of you know wound up siding with the, the court's four more liberal justices on the result in the case, which was that uh, as it stood at the time, the government could not use the citizenship question on the census. Um, he agreed and the, the, the more conservative justices agreed that the decision did not violate the Constitution's enumerations clause. Um, he agreed that the, the government does have a lot of latitude to include a citizenship question on the census but then he parted from his more conservative col from the other conservative colleagues and said, "You just you can't do it this way." Um, and so he said, "You sent it back to the Department of Commerce." And we, we were never quite sure exactly what was going to happen at the Department of Commerce when they sent it back. Um, we didn't find out in the end because, as you know, the government decided not to pursue it. Um, but it was like the the healthcare case to me in the sense that. Uh, the conservatives were really mad at the Chief Justice, um, but I think in the long run he gave conservatives a lot of what they wanted because he said you can use a citizenship question, you just can't do it this way. Um, I think the government was surprised. They issued a, a statement at shortly after the court's ruling that said um, we're, dis we're disappointed um, and then the c continued in the lower courts and initially it looked like they were going to throw in the towel. They reversed course. Um, and then in the middle of July, uh, finally wound, wound up giving up. Uh, in September, just a, a couple of weeks ago, Joan Biskupic of CNN, who wrote a biography of the Chief Justice just uh, this year, had a story s reporting that the Chief Justice had in fact switched his vote in the case. Um, so, you know, I, I we don't know exactly what happened and why. My guess is that the, all of the evidence just seemed so unseemly that the Chief Justice was trying to find some sort of narrow path to say to the government, like, we're not going to let you do this. You know, we'll leave the door open to do it in a, in a future census, but we're not going to let you do it this way right now. Do you want to add anything? That's what everyone Well, uh, okay. So I, I think the census case uh, and the DACA case on the – the Dreamers, which is going to be heard this coming term. So this is um, our transition, right? <laughs> well, uh, illustrate something more general about the Trump administration and the courts uh, and judicial review in, in this era. Uh, and uh, what I want to highlight in particular, which I think is not to say anything particularly political or controversial about the Trump administration, I think this is a, will be a widely shared perspective, um, it, it's clear that at least some of these significant decisions come out of a very rushed process. Uh, the obvious first example were the initial travel ban, executive orders that created chaos at the airports. Um, and they don't involve the usual kind of interagency process within the government going back and forth, getting comments, responding to comments, developing policy in that way. Um, and also, I think the administration, for the most part, doesn't really value lawyers a great deal. Um, and, uh, and so what you see going on in both the census case and the DACA case uh, is that the government developed justifications for the policies at issue that uh, create real problems for the administration in defending these policies. Uh, and in many ways, they are shooting themselves in the foot by doing policy in such a sloppy and unvetted and unlawyerly way that policies they might otherwise be able to adopt legally uh, become much harder to defend 
uh, because of the way they were done and the arguments that are given to justify doing them. Uh, and the census case obviously is an illustration of this. Uh, so the question, can the government add a citizenship question on the census? Um, there are a variety of reasons the government could offer for doing that. Uh, the government didn't offer the reasons. We can talk a little bit more about what they might be. Um, instead, it gave this reason that it, the information was needed to enforce the Voting Rights Act. But when the process of coming up with that rationale was exposed through litigation, it turned out to be a, a very kind of hard to credit basis for the policy uh, because the Commerce Department seemed to have to drag this out of the Justice Department. And it, it, at the end of the day, uh, the court uh, held that we, we just find it hard to believe this is the reason for this policy. Uh, and so the court concluded the, the reason the government gave uh, and for administrative agencies, um, this is part of judicial review from the courts. Uh, the, the reason uh, seems just contrived. It seems like a pretext. They use the word contrived. Now the court never said what it was a pretext for. Mm -hmm. Like what was the real reason if this was a hard reason to believe as the basis for this decision. Um, but there are some obvious reasons that the government might have given for this. For example, uh, part of what the census does is it collects important demographic information. Uh, and citizen, a question about citizenship had been on the census for many, many decades. Most countries do ask about citizenship in their census because they all do censuses as well. Uh, we, the census asks questions about uh, uh, are you married, are you single, Ver various things that are relevant demographic information. They didn't say that. Um, and there was always this question of whether the real reason uh, they wanted to ask this question was to enable states and local governments to draw election districts based not on the total number of people, but on the number of eligible voters. Um, now, whether that is a constitutionally valid way to draw districts is a completely open question. Um, it, I have taken a view on the question, and my view is the Constitution, the relevant doctrines and provisions are better understood to require use of total persons, not eligible voters. But I will tell you, I don't, I don't think there's a very obviously clear answer to that question. I mean, I think it's a legitimately debatable question. Um, had the administration said that's why they were doing it, uh, I think very likely the court would have upheld it based on the rest of the opinion that Chief Justice Roberts wrote. Um, why didn't the administration give these kinds of reasons for it? I don't know. I, I think it may be they were confused or the people you know, making this decision and defending it in a memo were confused about it. It may be that they were afraid this rationale would be too politically controversial, but including the question was controversial no matter what. So in any event, that's you know, the reason the court struck down the citizenship question was, as Amy said, because the court just couldn't accept that the reason the government gave for asking it was a actually the real reason. So, so if, if you could if we could transition then to DACA, how are some of these things going so this to play it, out? It, this is very, very similar with um, DACA. So uh, the Obama administration, as you know, uh, after uh, failing to get Congress to you know, pass legislation in this area, uh, ultimately decided to issue an executive order that's called the DACA order, uh, giving temporary deferred uh, action status to the DREAMers. Um, and then the Trump administration came in and they wanted to repeal that by executive order as well. Uh, so you might think, well, if one administration can adopt an order like this, why can't the second administration decide it doesn't agree with that policy and to revoke that order? Um, but here too, the issue is what the government said in its official documents uh, as the justification for this action. So what happened is you got a very short 
letter from um, Attorney General Sessions at the time to the head of Homeland Security uh, saying something that he had said and uh, uh, various Republican candidates had said and members of Congress had said uh, they, that, that the Obama administration order was illegal. And so they were revoking it because they thought it was illegal. Uh, and so then we start getting into debates in the courts about, well, if that's the reason for revoking it, um, was it illegal? And if it wasn't illegal, do you actually have any valid basis for revoking this, if that's your only reason for revoking it? Now, again, this is a major policy decision that is um, embodied in a, I think it's a two-page letter from the Attorney General to the head of Homeland Security. Um, instead of a thoughtful set of lots of additional reasons you could imagine the government offering, including we don't agree as a policy matter you know, with this policy choice. Um, so the Obama administration had one policy, we have a different policy, and we're entitled to adopt our policy hmm. um, through this action. Um, but it's this exactly the same kind of structure as the census case, a very sloppy, quick, shallow legal document justifying the action which might be permissible if justified in a kind of fuller and more convincing way uh, that then creates problems. Now there's something different, and I'll finish with this about DACA, which is uh, the subsequent uh, head of the Homeland Security Department, Nielsen, um, with at the invitation of the federal district court, did issue later a longer and fuller justification for this rescission. Um, and so in the DACA case, you actually have a more complicated situation than the census case, because you, you actually have an initial justification for the administration, which has all of these problems I discussed, and then a subsequent one, which has a number of other rationales beyond just the Obama administration acted unlawfully, that's why we're getting rid of this. Uh, and so my guess uh, would be that the, the DACA rescission is gonna fare better in the Supreme Court than the census citizenship question, um, but we will obviously see what happens with that. So, so if I can just say one thing, uh, and then I, I think Milan, you may want to say something as well. For those of you who are first year law students, and we often have many uh, who are here, these dusty old doctrines of administrative law are part of the focus of your course called legislation in the regulatory state, which for my sins I teach. Um, and um, I think what you'll see the court struggling with as, and, and I think this is true, this was clear in the census case, as it's using these very, very old doctrines, re requirements of uh, reasonableness and transparency. Uh, um, the, if the court is gonna disagree with the Trump administration, it's also going to not want to make bad administrative law, so it's going to constantly distinguish, you know, explain all of the ways in which, you know, as, as, as Amy and Rick said, you could have reached this decision in a lawful way, all of the ways in which politics and uh, overarching uh, uh, administration strategy can uh, play a role in agency decision making and then distinguish the ways in which this particular agency got it wrong. So maybe that's yeah, it. Just two quick points on the DACA cases. I actually yeah. disagree um, very mildly with, with, uh, with Professor Pilgrim's point. I, I think that this case is different from the census case in that I don't really think anyone thinks there was a pretext involved. I think that you may be right that this wasn't lawyered the right way and they, they should have done a better job of, of giving a fuller set of reasons at the outset. But I don't think that here anyone really thinks that, that the problem was that the administration said reason X when they didn't really believe it or they were trying to say reason X instead of reason Y and that was their true reason. My suspicion is that what really was going on is that they really did believe that this policy is unlawful. And in addition to that, they also think it's bad policy. They also think if they have discretion, they would get rid of it they could probably give you 15 reasons. Um, so I do think that there is that minor difference, and I do think that was pretty significant in the Chief Justice's decision in the census case, that he thought that, you know, he was he was willing to stomach a lot in terms of giving discretion to agencies, but, but I think when he looked at the evidence, he seemed to conclude that he just didn't buy the explanation, that the explanation being given was a legitimate one in terms of actually reflecting the decision maker's thinking. Um, I think the other point that's interesting is kind of a, a, a side note to the discussion so far on the, on the DACA case, is that 
you know, a version of this case or a similar version of this case came up to the court a few years ago um, and was decided, uh, sort of, not really, it was sort of avoided because Justice Scalia passed away and so the court didn't reach a precedential decision. I think they were looking at that point at the DAPA program, yeah. which involved the parents, um, n not, the, not the children. Um, but one argument that the Obama administration made in that case was that this was just not judicially reviewable at all. And they said, you know, this is a question ultimately about how we enforce the immigration laws. We have prosecutorial discretion in how we enforce the, uh, the immigration laws. Courts need to stay out of that. And what's interesting is that you now see the Trump administration making those exact same arguments here. Um, and so I, I, I'm sort of skeptical that the court is gonna think it can't rule on these questions. But despite the wildly different positions on the merits that both administrations have, you do see the executive coming in and trying to tell the court just to stay out of it. Um, and I think that's interesting. So I, I guess in fact that decision that the Trump administration is pointing to as part of the justification for why it believes DACA is unlawful. Right. Um, if I may, I'd, I'd, I'd like to move on from this. We have a few other uh, blockbusters of the coming term that we, we'd like to talk about. Um, uh, and I have the, the delight of introducing you to the, the, the Title VII sexual orientation and transgender discrimination cases that are pending before the court. Um, um, so Title VII is passed in uh, 1964. It bars discrimination because of sex. Since 1975, every Congress has seen proposed legislation to reach at least sexual orientation through amendment to Title VII does not pass. Whether that matters or not is intensely debated in the cases that are pending before the court. Um, these are core statutory interpretation cases where those kinds of questions are going to come up. Um, until 2017, no court of appeals had ever held that the status of being gay or uh, lesbian or transgender is a basis for covered uh, discrimination under Title VII. But it doesn't mean that under current law, um, LGBTQ men and women were not getting relief from the courts. Um, where, and let me focus on sexual orientation, I'll get to transgender um, at the end. When gender non-conforming behavior uh, was at issue, Plaintiffs were winning cases, and they were winning cases on a number of different theories under current, under existing law, but the main one of those theories was anti-stereotyping theory, um, which is a, an interpretation of Title VII that had come into the law in 1989 in a case called Price Waterhouse. The thing is that in these cases, victory or defeat turned on fine factual distinctions all amounting to the question of how well the plaintiff managed to show that it was displays of gender non-conforming behavior rather than their status as a, a, a gay person or a lesbian um, that was the reason that the employer discriminated against them. Um, Anti-stereotyping was only one of a number of the ordinary tools of Title VII analysis that were used in these cases that could factually um, get people to relief. Another one of those theories was associational discrimination, uh, something that basically comes out of the Supreme Court's approach to anti-miscegenation cases in the famous case Loving versus Virginia, um, where um, if you are a man discriminated against for choosing a male intimate partner, it doesn't matter that females are also discriminated against for choosing female sexual partners. Um, it's still uh, sex discrimination, just as the equivalent was still race discrimination under Loving. Um, but here, too, the theory turned on conduct. And there were certainly cases where really all a plaintiff could show is that it is, it is, it is my very status as a gay person um, that's the reason that the employer is doing this to me. Um, and the courts of appeal, uh, the courts in, you know, just increasingly found themselves frustrated with having to do this kind of fact-specific analysis when what they really needed was something more global. Um, in 2015, in large part to create that more unified approach, the EEOC, the e Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, um, adopted for the first time the position that what I would call status-based decision, uh, um, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation was covered by the statute. Then two important courts of appeal, first the Seventh Circuit in the Hively case, then the Second Circuit here in, the, in New York in the Zarda case, went in that direction as well, relying on anti-stereotyping theory, associational theories, and numerous other ordinary Title VII theories to numerous dimension. Whatever the particular theory was that they were going to, that they were relying on, their basic point um, was that 
the ordinary workings of Title VII um, were good enough uh, to, to, to reach this. And in fact, um, the Second Circuit's opinion in Zarda um, is an opinion that I would describe as being dull by design. You know, when you hide your creativity in just acting as though this major new thing that you're talking about is a routine small next step under existing law. And you know, you would accept, expect great exhortations to personal liberty in, the, in, 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 in the, the, the style of the gay marriage cases, but instead what you get is stuff that you can barely turn the page because it seems so boring. But that's exactly the point, to make the argument rhetorically that this is just really a normal extension of the law. In addition to Price Waterhouse, there's another really important case that's at play here, and it's a statutory interpretation case called Ontale, which was a decision by Justice Scalia in which he said, it actually is a case that involved same-sex sexual harassment, interestingly enough, but it was a case in which he said for the court that statutory prohibitions often go beyond the principal evil to cover reasonably comparable evils, and it is ultimately the provisions of our laws rather than the principal concerns of our legislators by which we are governed. In other words, if you use on tail, it shouldn't matter that for the framers of Title VII, the thought that they had just passed a statute to bar sexual orientation and transgender discrimination would have seemed utterly absurd. Even if you believe that, the people who argue along the lines of Ontale would say, that's not what matters, right? Um, uh, what matters is, uh, is whether it fits the, the, um, the text of the statute um, as we, come to understand what sex discrimination is, and that understanding can be somewhat plastic. Um, there were very, very vibrant um, and important dissents in these cases. Those dissents have become the basis for the arguments on the other side. As to Ontale, the, the chief argument is basically, yes, we can be plastic and dynamic, but it has to be about the thing that Congress legislated, and that was sex discrimination, not sexual orientation discrimination. This is an attempt to bring it to a new category. And on Price Waterhouse, the argument is being made that sex stereotyping theory was never meant to be a standalone theory. It was just meant to be a way that you could show that an employer was distinguishing between men and uh, women uh, um, and doing it in a way that involved uh, stereotypes and the associational discrimination. Um, the counter here, and it's being made in the briefs, is that race is different, that you can't analogize from race to sex, that anti-miscegenation laws all along were about white supremacy, but anti-sex discrimination, anti-sexual orientation and transgender policies aren't um, showing bias on the basis of sex, that, that these laws are not about, let's say, male supremacy, to which my, res my response has always been, really, they're not? <laughs> um, there was a great article years ago, I've taught it for years, by Andrew Koppelman, who made the argument exactly that they are, um, that the gender norms that are being enforced here are norms that reinforce male supremacy. Interestingly, uh, th th that was cited by the Second Circuit in Zarda with a footnote that said, yeah, yeah, that argument is out there, but let's not go there. And Koppelman himself uh, is the co-author of a brief in these cases, and he doesn't go there. And I think that that's a suggestion that, that perhaps people think as maybe Judge Katzman did in the Second Circuit, that the more radical you are theoretically, the less likely you are to get to five in these cases. I think I'll stop there, if any of you want to add in. There's a lot, <laughs> lot to cover on that one. I, th I, think, uh, okay. <laughs> I think one of the interesting things about, that, uh, about the Title VII cases is the way in which they map on to debates about statutory interpretation. Yeah. I think um, we always forget about that. That's and great, thank you. you know, there's, yeah. a, there's a, a sort of battle, as, as you all know, and, and are, are, are learning, for those of you who are, who are yeah. new first years, uh, you know, a battle between sort of the textualist view that really focuses on the language of the statutes and a more purposivist uh, mode of interpretation that, that is, looks broader, looks at things like legislative history and tries to figure out sort of intentions as opposed to really focusing in on the text. And I think what's interesting about this, one of the things that's interesting is the way in which the, uh, the proponents of the broader view of Title VII have really um, done you know a lot of hard work to figure out how to make a, a, a textual argument out of the, the phrase um, because of sex and, uh, and 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 really push that because I think they realize they need a fifth vote in this case and it's gonna it could be tough to get that vote without doing something that's that's textualist I think it's also interesting to see a lot of the folks who would ordinarily be a little bit 
textualist skeptical and a little bit more into the purposivist side, sort of saying, well, yes, we, we, we know no one at the time thought this, but look at this exact word that they used, and you know, because of, of sex, that, that you can't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation without discriminating on the basis of sex in some sense, and therefore, it really does it require the broader interpretation. The final thing on this, if you look at the, uh, the, the opinions in the lower courts, I think you know, one of the, some of the most prominent textualist judges, and the one I'm thinking of, Judge Easterbrook on the Seventh Circuit, the Reagan appointee, one of the founders of sort of modern textualist interpretation, voted in favor of the broader view of Title VII. And Judge Lynch here in the Second Circuit, who is not a textualist and was not appointed by President Reagan, um, you know, did a, a, a sort of a deep dive into the history and, and was interpreting the history in the, in the mid-60s. He says, essentially, you know, this is not what people had in mind when they passed this statute. So I think, I think it really is interesting how it maps onto those debates. Well, I, I, think, I think that's great. And we could go on forever, but I'm not going to let us because I want to, I, I want to move to a couple of other cases. Um, uh, Amy and Rahman, um, you're interested in telling us a bit about uh, the, th this term's major case having to do with religion, which is a major issue uh, for this court, and I'd, I'd like you to move on to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, just very quickly, if, if do we want to take a question or two? So I'll, I'll do this one very quickly. That's okay. Yeah, um, so, th so there's a case called uh, Espinoza, which is very interesting and essentially involves the intersection between the free exercise clause of the First Amendment uh, and how it maps onto a, a Montana constitutional provision that prevents the state of Montana from, from providing uh, funds to religious entities. Um, and so the, the way this case came about was Montana passed a statute that was a taxpayer, a tax credit program that basically allowed people to take a tax credit if they made donations to scholarship programs. And then those scholarship programs would then give scholarships that could be used at, at private schools, either religious schools or non-religious schools. And through, after a whole bunch of, of wrangling in the lower courts, the Montana uh, Supreme Court ultimately strikes down that program, the entire program, uh, based on its constitutional provision, which says no state funding to religious schools, uh, and to religious entities. And so, so th the upshot is that as a result of, of, of that Montana constitutional provision, the entire program is struck down the court, the Supreme Court is going to have to address uh, whether, as a free exercise matter, whether you know a, a constitutional provision that essentially does not allow these kinds of programs to be in place, whether that passes uh, scrutiny under the free exercise clause. I think the the interesting thing in this case is is sort of how it fits into the the trend um, at the court in recent terms in a number of decisions, including the Trinity Lutheran decision, the Hosanna Tabor decision, the Masterpiece Cape Chop decision. You see the court being much more friendly and open to free exercise claims, um, and I think this is something that is uh, that is on the radar screen, especially of the the sort of right side of the court. And so I I think that that the conventional wisdom on this case is that uh, that you may see a, a broader free exercise clause emerge from it. So so we are we are time pressed. Um, I want to give Amy one chance to. Uh, there, there are other important uh, lines of cases um, that we haven't had a chance to address. Um, but before we open up for a couple of questions, um, uh, on the general subject of petitions to watch, issues that the court has not yet taken up, you have some words that you want to say about abortion cases to keep an eye out on. Yes, the Supreme Court does not, has, you know, we've got a lot of hot potatoes already on the Supreme Court's docket for this term. We haven't even, you know, we've already talked about the Title VII cases. We've talked, we've, we've got the Title VII cases. We've got religion. We haven't even had a chance to talk about guns. We don't have abortion, but we, uh, yet, I think, is the, the short answer to that. In 2016, as many of you may know, the Supreme Court struck down a Texas law that, among other things, required doct uh, doctors who perform abortions to have the privileges to admit patients at nearby hospitals. The, this was after Justice Scalia had passed away, and it was five to three with Justice Kennedy joining the court's four more liberal justices. Um, so, you know, fast forward to February of this year, and the Supreme Court had a request by abortion providers in Louisiana to block the state from enforcing a law that they say is virtually indistinguishable that bars, uh, that requires abortion providers to have active admitting privileges within 30 miles of the place where they provide abortion care. Um, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit had upheld the law, and so they were coming 
to the Supreme Court in February and asking the justices to block the law from going into effect. And they said, if you don't do this, we will have one doctor in Louisiana providing abortions for women who are in the early stages of their pregnancy. We will not have anyone providing abortions after 17 weeks. Um, you need four votes um, in the Supreme Court to grant review of your petition for certiorari. You need five votes for a stay. Um, so this was a little bit of a math problem for the abortion providers. You, they, you had the court's four more liberal justices, but you needed one more vote. Justice Kennedy has retired. Um, and so this also brings into play what Ramon had talked about with the shadow docket, these, these things, and this happens you know, uh, frequently uh, on a schedule that is not set. Sometimes it can happen in a couple of days or in the case of a, a, a execution, even in a couple of hours. Um, the Supreme Court will issue decisions. The, the majority in a case will, will frequently not provide any explanation of what it's doing or why. You don't always know who dissents. Um, they may provide a, a sort of indication that they dissented, and they may provide an explanation of why they're dissenting, but not always. But in this case, you know, when you've got the when it's closely divided, you you do, and so. The Chief Justice in this case actually joined the court's four more liberal justices to put the Louisiana law on hold to give the abortion providers time to file a petition for review. That petition for review is going to be up um, when the justices come back from their summer recess and have their first conference next Tuesday. Um, so that it, I think there's a good chance that that case could be back on the, that could be on the court's docket on the merits during the upcoming term. Right. Thanks, Amy. So um, I, I, I want to say that we have time for one or two ah, questions. <laughs> right? um, uh, and if you want to ask a question, uh, a mic will come to you. No? Yeah, I cut Amy off too soon. Mm -hmm. I, guess, I guess what I can just do is, is then point at, just by way of a list, point out a couple of other, a, a couple of other cases to watch. We've got an important, uh, possibly important Second Amendment case involving New York City's gun control law, a case that might go off on mootness, but might raise some interesting questions on the merits about how uh, tiered scrutiny works in the Second Amendment setting. Um, we've got a stack of interesting criminal cases, including some core issues like the constitutional necessity for an insanity defense, the requirement, uh, if there is one, of, un of unanimity in jury verdicts in criminal cases. Um, and we've even got the George Washington Bridge, <laughs> a criminal case uh, involving uh, uh, um, a, a, a line of cases that's been of great concern to the court, which is, is the extent to which you can use ordinary fraud criminal statutes to get at political corruption. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a fascinating term, and that's even just the things we know about. The court's big October 1st conference, when it rounds out with lots of new certiorari grants, will give us uh, even more to not have time to talk about today. But I, but I thank you for being with us. And uh, you will see the relevance of your studies in law school to many of the cases that we've discussed. So thank you to the panel. And